text for this morning is Genesis 1 through to 15. In our series on Genesis, we reached chapter 15, but that was quite a while ago, so I thought this morning we would do a, a review of what we've seen so far and step back and see the, the big picture from 1 to 15. So we'll just read a few selections from our text. If you follow along in your Bible, chapter 1, verse 1 of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Chapter 2, verse 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bdellium and Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And then we have the fall. And then we look at verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden. He placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And then we have the developments leading up to the flood. We move now to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis 9, we'll read the first seven verses. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life that is its blood. And for your life blood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For, man, for God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. And now we come to chapter 15, verse 17. We'll read 15, verse 17, and the first sentence of chapter 16. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I give this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, 
the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we live in a world which is a cacophony of chaos. There are so many questions and conflicts and concerns that are just swirling around us as we look at the news, as we look at social media. So why are we here this morning singing psalms that are 3,000 years old and listening to an exposition of a text a document which is three and a half thousand years old. Aren't there more relevant things to be talking about? There is hatred of all that is good. There is the violent persecution of the church Catholic in in China and in the Middle East and some parts of Africa. And there is growing hatred against Christianity in the West. More and more you see people saying that religion, specifically Christianity, is a poison. And there are health crises and economic crises and political crises in, in our country and in our province. And there are questions about the future, about our children and their education, about our career, about our retirement, and there are personal struggles. There's the fallout of abuse and betrayal and job loss and financial difficulty and mourning and chronic pain and ravaging disease and impending death. So why do we have a sermon about 10 principles which we can apply to deal with these things that we're facing in our life right here, right now. Why are we going back three and a half thousand years to Genesis 1 through to 15? Well, yesterday I sent a little picture in your email. I don't know how many of you saw it. It's just a little square, mainly red and a little bit of white through it. It's a couple of square centimeters of a very famous painting. And the painting is this, has this title, The Militia Company of District 2 under the command of Captain Franz Bannock Koch. You know probably this painting by its more popular title, The Night Watch by Rembrandt. And the little detail that I sent in your email is a little part of the the red sash that the captain is wearing. And you see that little white thing is a little detail from the lace that trims that sash. I don't think anybody got that. At least, if they did, they didn't tell me. And that's your life. When we look at our lives, we can't understand what's going on. We can't understand what it is. We can't understand the dark patches and the dark shading, why it has to be there, until we zoom way back and we put it all in the context of the great picture, the great panorama of what God is doing in the universe and in history. And that perspective we can only get from the Word of God. The Word of God gives us the whole picture. The Word of God gives us the breathtaking sweep of the history of creation and the history of redemption and the history of the world and the history of God's family. That's our family. That's us. So before we proceed with chapter 16, we'll we'll review this morning the first 15 chapters of Genesis as we look at the big picture. And we read a few snippets from our text, starting in chapter 1, God made the world. And he made it not to be a wasteland, but he made it to be filled with people, filled with love, filled with worship. And he told them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, have dominion over it. So God made a gorgeous home to be filled with a family of love. And I've mentioned this before but it bears repeating. 
God made humans differently than the animals. The animals were created in their myriad numbers. The seas were teeming with fish and marine life. The earth was teeming with all kinds of life. The, the, the skies were teeming with birds. But God only made two people. And if we reflect on that, we understand that what God wanted for his children was that every worshiper on this earth would be the product of the most holy and pure love. So God made the world. And as we come to Genesis chapter 2, we'll be going very quickly through our text here, because it's a long one. As we come to chapter 2, there's that first toledote, that first generations of, the first account of what happened. What happened to the heavens and the earth? What came out of that? Out of that home that God created and that people that he created? Well, we see in chapter 2 that that focus as the camera zooms in on the Garden of Eden. We see that, that home within a home, that holy of holies in which a man and woman can be in fellowship with God and begin their marriage and their family. It's a good start. But then chapter 3, things go off the rails. We choose death. We betray the, the kingdom into the, the hands of the enemy. We trash the home and turn our backs on the Father. And it becomes now a place of dangers and weeds and thorns and pain and sickness and suffering and death. Everything which is the opposite of what God made things to be. And then already in Genesis chapter 3, right after the fall, God begins sketching out his plan for the renewal of all things. For the renewal and the restoration of a land and a people, a home and a family an offspring, and an inheritance. God will restore what we destroyed, what we gave up, what we lost. And that theme goes right through the scripture. And so there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the mother of all promises, God promises this blessed enmity between those who hate God and his people, those who love God. He will not let the whole human race be on the side of the enemy. He will always keep for himself a church, even though sometimes she is hardly to be perceived in the eyes of the world. And in that chapter 3, verse 15, he promises the descendant, the seed who will crush the head of the serpent, who will have victory over the homebreaker, the home destroyer, the family killer. And then in chapter 4, we see the results of what happened. There's murder, murder of a brother by his brother. There's the godless power and, and the cultural leadership of the wicked. And all that can be said about the church is that they call on the name of the Lord. They live in dependence on God. Then we come to chapter 5, and there's the, the second toledote, the second of those 10 sections in Genesis. In chapter 5, just hammers at home, doesn't it? These are the generations of Adam. Well, here's this guy and this guy and this guy, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. That's what comes. That's what, the, what, the, what, what Adam's life brings forth, death. And then Genesis chapter 6, we come to the third section, the third tolerant of Noah, and the earth is filled with wickedness and Every thought and inclination of man's heart is always evil and only evil. And so God literally hoses down the world. There's a great cataclysm. And the children remember perhaps that cataclysm literally means washing down. God brings the world back. He rewinds the tape as it were. He brings it back to its watery beginnings. You remember in Genesis chapter 1 where the spirit was hovering over the waters. It was dark. And in the flood, God kind of brings things right back to that place and then starts recreating or restoring. And he picks one man, a righteous man, a blameless man. But what happens right after the, the flood? Noah, that righteous, blameless man, the most righteous guy in the whole world, the only one together with his family who was actually saved, there he is drunk in his tent and naked and, and in his shame and his son mocking and his grandson cursed. Didn't take long. Things were right back 
in the direction of where they had been headed before the flood. And so Genesis chapter 10, we have the fourth Toledot, the sons of Noah, with a table of nations. And it's all the peoples of the earth who either passively, because they're far away, or actively stand against God and his people. They're enemies of the people of God. And in that table of nations in chapter 10, there are even descendants of Shem, the holy line, who have turned against God and his people. And then we come to the sixth Toledot. And as you, you see now in the sixth Toledot, the second uh, five of the ten, the camera zooms right in on, on one family and one people, Abraham and his descendants. The sixth Toledot is called Terah's Toledot, the generations of Terah, because Abraham comes from Terah, but then Isaac and Jacob get their wives from the clan which descends from Terah. So they're all connected. And so in this sixth Toledot, when it has become clear that working with the entire population of the world is not going to work again, it hasn't worked twice now, God, to keep the knowledge of the gospel alive, to keep the holy seed separate and pure, he begins to work with Abram to make for himself a peculiar people, a people that is separated from the world to his worship, to his service. And he promises Abraham what? He promises Abram land and people. That theme goes straight through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. He promises a home and a family. And so then God continues from this point throughout the Old Testament, sketching out his plan of redemption, and the lines become bolder, and the outline appears more and more clearly. As we go and look at the stories of Abraham and the history of the Exodus, and then the tabernacle, and then the temple, and then the exile, and then the return, all of that pointing to that great seed of the woman, the Redeemer who is coming. And then when he comes, what the Old Testament sketches out in bold lines is now filled in with glorious detail and color at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And the scripture speaks about land and people in connection with the work of Christ. Paul speaks about that to the Romans in chapter 8. He speaks about the creation, our home, that it's groaning, that it's in bondage to corruption, and that it is longing eagerly for the day when we will be set free. Our home is longing for the day when the family of God will be restored. Our home, the creation, is groaning and longing for the revealing of the glory of the sons of God. So how does this theme of people and land through Genesis and through the whole scripture, how does it apply to us? Well, we sang Psalm 37, and you may not have noticed it in, in stanza five, because it's a different word used in the sung version. But in 37 stanza five, we have the Old Testament words in, in, the, in the written text of Scripture, the meek shall inherit the earth. That's quoted later on in the New Testament. The meek shall inherit the earth. Those who are dispossessed and disenfranchised, those who are rejected and despised, the weak and the unimportant, the people of God, that is the church, and the church grows as the gospel is preached to all the nations as sinners turn to Christ and are baptized and received into the people of God and they marry and they raise children. God's plan is going forward to restore to us what we lost, a land and a people, a home and a family. Now, as far as the land goes, we're kind of in Abram's situation Abram was there in the land of Canaan, which is a picture of the, the, big, the big message of, of the restoration of the world. But Abram was there as a sojourner in the very land that he was to inherit. He, he couldn't 
take control of it yet. He couldn't rule over it yet. And we're in the same situation. We don't have physical ownership. One day we will rule over all of the seas and the mountains and, and the continents. Right now, we're just aliens and strangers passing through like Abram was. And we read chapter 16, verse 1. There's Abram with these glorious promises. God says to him, Abram, I'm going to give you this land. But he doesn't have anything except a burial place eventually. And God says to Abram, I'm going to make you into a great people. But he has no children. So God's given all these wonderful promises, but he doesn't see it in his life. His life says the opposite. And isn't that the case for us too? We do not yet see the fullness of the consummation of the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do not yet see the church Catholic as God promises us that it will be a number that no man can number from every tribe and tongue and language and nation and people. And so we have to do what Abram had to do. God makes these promises. We look around and say, Lord, I don't see it. It's not happening yet. I don't see it. And so God says to us, live like Abram lived. Live like your father Abram. We live by promise. And the scripture over and over calls believers to live not by sight, but by faith. And over and over, God hammers home to us the truth that when he makes a promise, he keeps the promise. All of his promises are yes and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. He kept them to Abram. We read that, right, in Isaiah chapter 51. And God says to the people in exile, listen, remember what I did to Abram. He, remember the rock from which you were hewn. Where do you come from? You come from this man who, was, who had no children and had no place to live that he could call home. And now you have a land which has been restored to you and you are a people. And so they were called to live by faith and see what God had done. He kept his promises to Abram, our father. He kept his promises to the people of God in the time of the exile. He kept his promises in sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will keep his promises to us. There was Father Abram. There was Mother Sarah. They were a childless couple. They were strangers in a strange land. And God made them into a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And we look around at this world that is in our, our inheritance, and we are strangers and exiles and aliens in it. And we look around at the church, and it's so small and so ineffective and so despised. And we see enemies filling the land, dark, malevolent powers which hate God and hate the church and hate holiness and, and hate life. And the power of sin afflicts us and brings us so much damage and distress. And we look at our little lives and all the dark shading and all the pain and all the, the, the concern. And God calls us to step back and look at the big picture. I don't see it yet, but I believe that God is at work. And I hold on to the promises that he has given me in Christ. And I live by faith, even when assailed by, by doubts. I hold on to the promises. When assailed by temptation, I hold on to the promises. When I'm oppressed and when the, the demons of addiction have their claws into me, then I hold on to the promises. And when my children turn away from God, I hold on to the promises. And when the love of many grows cold and churches that we loved have turned from the gospel, we hold on to the promises. And when the world becomes increasingly inhospitable to Christianity, we hold on to the promises. And when wickedness abounds, 
comes and we see our utter inability to transform this world into what it should be, into what it was made to be, we hold on to the promises. And when we have questions about the future, about our children, about our education, our career, our retirement, when we have personal struggles, the fallout of abuse and betrayal, job loss, financial difficulty, mourning, chronic pain, ravaging disease, and impending death, we hold on to the promises. Because what are we going to sing in a few moments? We're going to sing the last stanza of Psalm 37. Now, this is, this is the gospel, and in those sketched out terms, applying, first of all, to the land of promise, but it's a picture of the cosmic truths of the gospel and the restoration of all things in Christ. Observe the upright and the just consider. There is a future for the man of peace because all the forces of darkness and the powers of sin and evil and wickedness and corruption, uh, the corruption of disease and of death will all be wiped out from God's creation, from the home that he has made for us. Then will the just rejoice with one another in blessings that will evermore increase. That's what we're about to sing. We're about to sing the gospel, brothers and sisters. Because the day is coming. It's coming closer every day. It's coming closer every week. When the ransomed of the Lord shall return, when our exile is over, and we shall come to Zion with singing, and everlasting joy shall be upon our heads, and we shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Do you get the picture? Sorrow and sighing will flee away. And so we can sing. We're going to sing at the end of the service. Hymn 71. The hope of faith shall not deceive us. The Savior's words are true and sure. That hope must soften all our sorrow. Come, fellow pilgrims, heads then high. For those who bide salvation's morrow, the hills are level, seas are dry. O oh, blessedness above all measure. O oh, joy when once all grief is banned. There is our heart. There is our treasure. When we are in the promised land. Amen.